Hello to everyone. I'm hoping you're all fine and ready and excited to start the course of taxation today. Uh, because the last week we have met, we've spent time in introducing this course, lots of guidelines. I came to share lots of things we have talked about, but we could not start the course. And today is the time that we are making a start of a course. And you will start getting to see the way the live online courses are conducted and the way the lectures are delivered by the use of lecture notes, summary notes, whiteboard explanations, practices. You will start getting to know that all from today, the moment we will start the lecture. Uh, if any one of you, I know many of you, they have joined me in between last week. They have not been the part of my first introductory course. They, I hope they already have been able to access the platform so far since I have advised them to access it and watch the recording of the first session before coming into this one. I hope they have, and if they have not, they should be able to this weekend, say tomorrow. Because lots of things, when you come into a new course, you get to know which you people, those they have joined me in between, they have been missing it out from their life. And they must have to be informed of before starting the course. Uh, topic was not discussed, but there are a lot of things that being a student of taxation, being a student of ACCA, being a student of distance learning course, you must have been informed of, I have given my precious advices, guidelines, and about tax course also, the exam pattern, the course content, the way the courses will go by, when the course will finish, the revision courses, the practices, all of that stuff. I have been able to spend a lot of my time on that so that the whole course was exhausted. So I really want you to take a time out this weekend itself. Today is Saturday. You still have a day of tomorrow off. Watch it. So that the whole journey uh, will become smooth. Uh, and uh, you, th that lecture of the last week has set up the whole tone for the courses to start as from today. The others, they have been aware of lots of things that you are not. So please take a time out of your busy life and itself this weekend, try to watch it. But yes, to, today we are taking a start of a course. We people all have met the last week. We have talked about that we will be starting the course of ours from the area of capital gains tax. So without wasting much of a time, without wasting um, getting into anything, I was still helping some of the students before the session joining in. Probably those students, they have joined me in between. So it's it's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to help because it's their right to be provided with the full help so that they get into the class and they get to know this whole portal. So I believe the registrations will stop coming to my way this week uh, and we will be able to get the better shape of a badge by coming weekend. Still, I am getting admissions these days, but this, this, this two week time will come to an end and it will be all fine. So I'll connect you all to the board to really kick off the course. If you look into this file, you people clearly have seen me uh, planning that, okay, which area of the course we will be starting it on the first and you clearly can see once more time, it's this area. That is the first one we are taking it into our talk and we'll take the next five to six sessions straight away on. And this is a chapter we're making a start from chapter 17, capital gains tax for individuals, P6. So with that, you've got this chapter in front. Alongside the board work of The capital gains tax 
is a topic which you people have seen me uh, giving you the exam significance of each topic the last week also, where you people have seen the capital gains tax is testable in section B of the exam by taking a 10 mark question and two to three objective test questions in section A type questions, overall a topic of 15 to 20 marks. And this is what I can come down to give you the reminder of that one more time itself in the board explanation, capital gains tax, testable in exam for this much percentage, 15 to 20%. Exactly in which section, section A and in section B. In section A, you can expect to have two to three objective test questions. We know that your objective test question is for two marks each. And can have three to four at times, but on average two to three. While section B takes one question, which we know that is for 10 marks. Which we know that is for 10 marks. So this how the way for about 15 to 20%, the exam significance of the topic we will be spending the next five to six sessions on. Every time you will open this whiteboard explanation, this page you will land yourself on. And this will naturally be giving you this revision of, okay, capital gains tax, 15 to 20% of the marks in section A and section B of the exam. So naturally being the part of this process, you will be able to remember it forever till the time of exam at least. What is the scope of a topic? Basic scope of the topic is that this is individual who owns an asset. For example, a plant a property, a motor car, or even a building, land, sells it up to someone, sells it to someone, that someone can be an individual, not necessarily it has to be a company, or it can be a company. So buyer can even be a company, or an individual, whatever the gain, the individual will make out of it. This gain is what we call it as capital gains. Since it is on the disposal of capital asset. So the gain that we get it on is called as capital gain. And then the individual will go to pay what on? The tax, which is what we call it as capital gains tax. That's the basic scope of a topic. You must have to keep into your mind from the start of this topic today. Being an individual, I own an asset which can be of any type, plant, property, motor car, fixed assets, non-current assets, is what we are talking about right now, not goods. Being sold out to someone, maybe an individual or to a company, and whatever the amount of the gain that we have realized it on, the tax that we will subject to pay on that is called as capital gains tax. So this topic is all about dealing with disposals of assets. Assets then can be of many types, you will see in this entire journey, but the basic theme of the topic will remain to say for the next five to six sessions, sale of assets, sale of assets, sale of assets. That's going to be the scope of, scope of ours for the next five to six sessions.
Being an individual, I own a property, which I sell it to someone. Whatever the gain that I make out of that, the tax I will pay on that is called as capital gains tax. Convinced? Now, if I have to define the capital gains tax in a bookish manner, the way the books have written it. So let's go that way also. So capital gains tax in this manner has been defined in the lecture notes and in the books. It says that the capital gains tax arises on the chargeable disposals of the chargeable asset by a chargeable person. Let me write it. Chargeable disposals of chargeable assets by a chargeable person. Chargeable disposals of the chargeable assets by a chargeable person. Good. Even the definition, the bookish definition of the topic of capital gains, I'm trying to make it a lot simpler by dividing it into three parts. In a one go, it's, it's like capital gains tax arises on the chargeable disposal of the chargeable asset by the chargeable person. But the whole of that sentence been trying to make it more friendlier for you to understand. So let's go to define one by one. What is chargeable disposal? What is chargeable asset? And then who is chargeable person? All of the three conditions is like a checklist. All three must have to be checked in for a capital gains tax to arise. If these two are checked, this one is not, no capital gains tax. If these two are ticked, this one is not, no capital gains tax. All of the three will have to be satisfied for the capital gains tax to arise. What makes the disposal to say a chargeable one? Let's invest the next two, three minutes over to it. The chargeable disposal are those events within which, with the happenings of which the capital gains tax arises. So I can come down to write them this manner. Are those events that on the happenings of which are those transactions by the happenings of which the capital gains tax arise? Number one, top of the list, sale of an asset. As I told you that this topic is about having a sale of assets. So the top of the list, event is sale. But sale is not the only event. We can have what? Gift of asset also. So gift of asset is also an event that is subject to capital gains tax. Exchange of an asset. And lastly, when an asset is, when an asset is, Destroyed, which has been insured, all of these events, they result into the charging of capital gains tax. Now, this is, these are those whiteboard explanations that I was talking about. So whatever I will do in, on a board, first of all, it's becoming a part of this whole recording. Secondly, you'll get the cop you, you'll get the whole copy of this file, my handwritten file into your hands in the PDF. So you do not have to be really worried what's been there at your side. Just have to focus onto a screen and ears. So that at least you learn these things. Do not be worried for the notes making because I'm doing that for you. You'll get the copy of that. And that's the reason why that I, I have to take a good care of even writing it in the live course so that you can recognize my handwriting. You can, you, you, I'll try to make it more and you 
more and more beautified so that should not be a problem for you to later uh, guess what's written. Even if, when you've been the part of a course, you will be able to recognize it. Even if, if it is not readable, because you already have taken a course and have seen me talking about. Okay. So either there has been a sale of asset, there has been a gift of asset, there has been an exchange of asset, there has been a destruction. All of those four events results into what? Capital gains tax. As long as the asset that has been disposed must have been a chargeable one. So usually all assets are chargeable. All assets are chargeable. Except exempt. So we will have to see the list of these exempt assets in a while on the lecture notes. Most of the assets are chargeable. Few of them are not. So if we can remember the list of those few, other than those few, everything is chargeable. It's as if I have 100 assets. 95 of them will be chargeable. Five of them will not be. So better to remember the list of five. Those are not chargeable. Minus the rest, 95 will automatically be chargeable. This is the whole talk. So I'll, I'll come to reveal the list of exempt assets in a while. But usually everything is chargeable. There are specific few items which are not. I'll come to reveal the list of that in a while. Who is a chargeable person? A person who is a UK person. It's called as UK resident. And or ordinarily resident. So we will look into the definition of this UK residence thing later. But not today. Today the concern is that the person who uh, is a UK resident is said to be a chargeable person in UK. And there is a certain criteria for a person to achieve this status by being in the UK for that much number of days, not leaving the UK for that far, coming back to... So there, there is a way to achieve that status. It's, it's a different debate. We will come to talk about this later on. Clearly, a tourist who go to visit the UK on a tourist, vacations and all, is not supposed to be called as a chargeable person. A UK resident has to be a person which is called as a taxable one to pay taxes. And we'll look into the definition of that at the later part of the course. So capital gains tax arises when you have done either of these four transactions of the chargeable asset by you and you must have to be a chargeable person. And this assumption is going to be taken into our exam. The person is a chargeable one. You will never be tested in a case where the person is not a chargeable. This is going to be an assumption that the person is a chargeable one. In advanced taxation, later, you will come to look into the scenarios where the person, if it is not a chargeable one, what sort of tax consequences he or she has to bear. But in taxation, at level two, a person will be an assumption to be a chargeable one. Let me go and take you back to the lecture notes to see how these things are written back. See. The same way, all of these three parts being underlined and separated. And then we come to look into the depth of each one by one, starting off my side with the first one. And you will not be surprised to see the same is written. Either there has been a sale of an asset or a gift of an asset or an exchange of an asset, or maybe there has been an insurance sum which you have collected upon the destruction or there has been a damage to an asset or may you have lost it because of the reason of being stolen or just somewhere lost capital sum over here means insurance money so this is a board work so obviously to make things easier just a word is used here you can see the whole sentence so again, you have to concentrate on that word that's been written in bold letter. Because that will solve the purpose. You just have to keep in the mind, okay, sale of asset. 
gift of asset, exchange of an asset. That's it. Nothing is there to grab. But at the end of the day, because these are the lecture notes, so obviously they are a bit formal. You, you can see the whole sentence is there for your proper facilitation. But the crux is that you should try to keep these four events into your mind, sale of asset, gift of asset, exchange of asset, and when an asset is destroyed, lost, or damaged, and it was on top of that being insured, these four events will result into a capital gains tax. As long as the asset that is in discussion is also a chargeable one. And that is the list of exempt assets I was talking about. I try to highlight them so that you should pay attention to this list. Because other than that list, everything is chargeable. So what this list contains, motors cars on the top of it, included vintage cars. Motor car, when disposes of, no capital gains consequences will arise. May it be any type of motor car, the emission-based, electric-powered, hybrid, the diesel one, the petrol one. May it be any type of a car, motor car, when they are disposed, they will not result into capital gains tax. Few investments, namely investments into individual savings account, investments into national savings certificates, Investments into qualifying corporate bonds, investments into government stocks, these four investments. So you have to remember it. Okay, there are four investments. The one is named as individual savings account. The second one is named as national savings certificates. The third one is named as qualifying corporate bond. Fourth one is named as government securities. At least this much of a time spending you have to do. And then the items like premium prize bond winnings and betting winnings. As you can see, writing premium bonds and price and bidding winnings are also exempt. Current assets. Do you really see this second last thing in print? The current assets rather being called as outside the scope of this topic. Outside. I should have written the two words together. Outside is the one word. Outside. of the scope. It's, it's called rather as not exempt asset. It should be called as excluded one. Because we started this topic by discussing Sale of asset, fixed asset, capital asset. So you will not expect to see ever coming to your way goods, inventory, receivables and all. This topic will revolve around taking the care of the sale of the non print assets. Other than that, there's hardly anything to remember into that list. So motor car, current assets, four investments, namely individual savings account, national savings certificates. We have qualifying corporate bonds. Qualifying corporate bond is, in fact, the loan stocks, debentures, and the government securities. Other than that, you have to remember that prize betting winnings are exempt, gambling, and the premium bonds. Don't look into this term certain chattels. Chattels will come to our way in chapter 19 of a course. We are into chapter 17 right now, so chapter 18, 19. Chapter 19, we will have to come and have a detailed talk over to this chattels because some of the chattels are chargeable some of them are not uh, so we will reveal the talk of this in chapter 19 so if i go to show to the preview of chapter 19 if i have it right now yeah it's been up there there we will come to look into the discussion of chattels as you can see chapter 19 chattel investing assets will come to our way then some of them are exempt some of them are taxable you can see it so we will have a detailed talk in regards to this at later stage. Shares can be the quoted one or unquoted one, ordinary preference, any type. Land and building, plant and machinery, everything will come in, except these, remember it. So better to remember this. If you can remember this, anything other than this will automatically be chargeable. And you will not take much of a time to remember it. But time definitely has to spend. There is no success otherwise. 
you yourself has to be a UK person. This, how the way this definition is there. And if I ask you to revise it, this way you will find it so boring to revise. You will rather keep yourself this way because definition is not something you'll be asked to rewrite. It's just a formality when you start the course and you get into the topic like capital gains tax. So you, you must have been good with the definition of that topic on the first before we get into the main business part of the chapter afterwards. So this definition has no significance. You will never be asked to rewrite it. But still, the way that this needs to be understood, I'm investing a time in, not asking you to cram it just, explaining to you the meaning of each word by dividing it. What if the person is non-UK, will not pay tax on worldwide asset? Worldwide means both the local and foreign properties. Local means those, those are in UK, foreign means non-UK outside the UK. And if the person is the chargeable one will pay taxes on worldwide disposals. Worldwide means both the properties that he has it in UK and the one that he has it abroad. Just written. But like I said to you, you will have to be making an assumption that in your course, the person has to be a chargeable one. And foreign property will not even be tested. All of these aspects you will come to see in advanced taxation course foreign properties and if what if the person is a non-UK one in your course a person is always an uh, assumption to be as a local person with local disposals UK disposals which of the following disposals may give rise to capital gains easy to guess because I have done the good talk about this and we can apply it now if you only had tried to cram this definition, you would have not been in a position to apply it. Now I can tell you how to apply it. See, in all those examples, let's go and make that assumption, which is what I told you that we will have to make an assumption that the person is a chargeable one. The person is a UK person. And that person is engaged in doing this all randomly. Let's pick any of the example. I'll go and pick the third one. Sale of motor car to a brother less than to the market value. What's wrong with this? Sale of motor car. I myself is a chargeable one. What I have done? Sale. Good. Sale of an asset is a chargeable event. But the type of asset that is involved is looking to me a little doubtful. Is exempt asset. So I myself is a chargeable person. What my action is chargeable. I'm selling it. But the type of asset is involved is not chargeable one. So capital gains tax consequences will not arise. This is the application of those three parts of the definition. The first part has been fulfilled. I am a chargeable person. Second part of the definition is also fulfilled. This is my action. I'm selling it. Third part of the definition is the asset has to be a chargeable one also, which the motor car is not, which means what? Capital gains tax will not arise. So this application is possible only when you are done with the understanding. If you had just tried to cram the definition, you would have not been in a position to apply it. Let's take another example. Exchange of a house for an apartment with a friend. So I myself is a chargeable one. What I have done is a type of chargeable disposal exchange. And this time, the type of an asset is a house, which looks to me fine. It's an asset. It's a property. So properties are never found to be the part of that list. It means if they are not being found to be the part of that list, automatically the disposal of the house will result into what? Capital gains tax. Sales of the shares in an unquoted trading company. Once again, it's a chargeable one since I'm the one selling. The type of asset that is involved is unquoted shares, which is this thing. And myself is a chargeable person. So that will lead to a capital gains tax. Gift of a Liverpool flat. 
by an individual who is neither a UK resident or ordinarily resident in UK. Now, there they specifically have mentioned to take that individual. So what he has done, gifting an asset is a chargeable event. Flat is a property chargeable asset. But myself is a not chargeable person this time. No matter, I'm selling an asset which is chargeable. No matter, my event is a chargeable one since I'm gifting. But I myself is not a chargeable person, cannot come to pay a capital gains tax in UK. How interesting the whole de definition becomes when you when you when you still try to learn it, although there's there's hardly any room for learning in it. Still, it's a good way to start the course where you have been able to scan the whole of that definition out formally, not casually, not half-heartedly. Sale of the 15% trade stock. Now, trade stock is a government security. Exchequer stocks, trade stocks, guilt at securities are all the government stocks. So the sale of them will not result into a capital gains tax because government security is an exempt asset in the list above can be seen. A gift of the painting. The painting is a chattel. So for chattel, we haven't had a talk about. Usually the chattels are chargeable. So if I can assume that this chattel is a chargeable one, so this will once again give a rise to a capital gains tax because there has been a gift of chattel involved. This is the first page of the topic which has exhausted somewhere around 30 minutes. But not really the business part of the chapter which we, we will be so much being concerned about. Preferably, you should keep the definition of that in a mind, but not really. It will play a part for all of the next topic to come, for all of the next classes to come on capital gains tax. This makes us to land finally on the main business part of the topic, which is the performer of computation. Let's try to put this on the screen for about a few seconds to try and digest it before I can come to explain each component of that from top to the bottom. You, you, you probably have seen this performer first time in your life because it's, it's not a financial statement. We're quite used to off with the financial statements and all. We are entered into a text course for the first time. La last time I told you that the taxation course is the first one in ACCA. So you, you, you have no prerequisites. Lots of things that you will come to experience will be for the first time. And you will find it a little hard in the few courses to try and adjust yourself to. But once you develop the whole theme of this branch of accounting and finance, taxation, you enjoy it. So that's the performer. I can place it in front to just to have a view for a few seconds before I can come to take each of that component into my talk. So that's how the way the capital gains tax is computed on the disposal of any asset. And the manner in which the capital gains tax liability is computed is presented below. The manner in which the capital gains tax liability is computed is presented below. Starts off with gross disposal proceeds. On the next, the incidental cost of disposal, net disposal proceeds, cost of acquisition, incidental cost of acquisition, enhancement expenditure, chargeable gain, reliefs, or maybe exemptions, chargeable gain, current year capital losses, brought forward capital losses, annual exemption, taxable gain, and uh, the rate of taxations to be multiplied to that figure to arrive at the answer of capital gains tax liability. I just have read this off. Uh, I'm not explaining it. That's the performer from top to the bottom. It's like you're preparing a profit and loss. You start off with revenue and then you come to subtract cost of sales. And then the first stopover after which you have an administration cost and a distribution cost to deduct to arrive at operating profit. 
and finance costs to arrive at profit before tax. So it takes that same sort of a theme as if you're preparing a profit and loss for a company. But that's not really a profit and loss. And it has got its own components, which requires to have a spending of time. So let's start with the gross disposal proceeds on the first. What it is, what are we supposed to take it in? And the number of possibilities, starting myself off with gross disposal proceeds. So what does it take normally? Uh, proceeds will take usually cash, isn't it? Did I write something so unusual? Apply this to your life. Normally when you sell an item to someone, uh, any item, what do you get in return? A cash or whatever you buy something from someone, what do you pay? A cash. So usually it takes the cash, but certainly not always the cash. At, at times we will have to, uh, take some other aspect, uh, other items into it. But to start off with, the first thing we will take it in is a cash. So I'll make one simple case where I can randomly write, uh, Mr. A has disposed an asset for 25,000 pound, which was previously acquired for 13,000. So if I have to now compute again on disposal, so I will start off with sale proceeds and I will be taking the cost the very next two to arrive me at the figure of the gain. The cost that they have incurred in acquiring this asset in the past was 13,000. But what are we going to take that for the balance of proceeds? The obvious, we are going to take this amount to be the part of proceeds. And what is it? A cash. So when the question says that Mr. A has disposed an asset for 25,000, that for 25,000 is what a cash proceeds. That's what we have taken to arrive at the figure of the game. So it was too obvious, but still early days of the course started myself off trying to take a good care of every small thing also. This thing is definitely a cash. And that is what we've been able to take that for the proceeds. So usually take proceeds, but occasionally it takes something else. And interestingly, we are heading towards. So keep yourself connected because now I'm going to make another case within which you will see a little bit of a change coming in. So that will require me to copy and paste the entire and we'll try to modify only to bring in the change. So this time the Mr. A has not disposed, rather the Mr. A has gifted. That is the first change. So in the case of the gift, what are we going to take? Mr. A has gifted an asset When the market value, when the market value of an asset was 30,000, which was previously being acquired for 13,000. See, how did I modify this whole in front of all of you? Obviously, this can save a lot of time for me also, thanks to this technology, not need to rewrite the entire stuff. Market value is given. MV stands for market value, 30,000 pound, which was previously been acquired for 13,000. So the cost remains to be the same. So I can happily copy and paste the same thing as above. The real issue is to take what in front of proceeds. Do we have anything to take? It was a disposal. What it is? A gift is a transaction in which the consideration is not involved. 
a gift is something in which the consideration is not involved. The cash is not involved. So what are we supposed to? Actually speaking, we should have not been taking anything over here. Actually, because actually there's no cash being exchanged. When it was exchanged, we have been able to write. So in this case, the law requires us to make an assumption. And that assumption is to take a market value. Actually, not the price that someone has exchanged, but for the sake of computation, we are supposed to use the market value, use the market value instead of proceeds. Instead of proceeds, we don't have proceeds. So we have no choice but to use the market value. Do we have any choice? Or else you don't take anything. Because actually speaking, there's no cash involved. So I should not be taking it. But when the, the assumption that they require us to make is to go and make the market value as if 30,000 is the amount that they've exchanged. So I came to write it to work again on that. So to understand these things, the basic case was constructed first so that you can compare it. And then you always can remember it that in a normal sale transaction, because the cash is involved, which is something that we come to write it, but in a gift transaction, no cash is involved. So what, what are we supposed to fix it in market value? Assumption. Actually, not the 30 that they have paid and I have received. But for the sake of computing the gain, market value on the date of gift must have to be used. Convinced? Things are not over yet. Now I'm going to make third and the last case under the banner of cross disposal proceeds. Third and the last case under the banner of cross disposal proceeds. So for that, I will have to take myself back to the first most illustration. Okay. Mr. A has disposed an asset for 25,000 pound to his son when the market value of an asset was market value of an asset was 35,000. Market value of an asset was 35,000, which was previously been acquired for 13. So I'm still continuing to take the cost because my discussion revolves around taking the care of disposal proceeds, not the cost at which it in the past it was being acquired at. So that remains to be the same throughout. Pretty much the same case as above. The first one, where the disposal being made for 25,000 to his son, when the market value of an asset was 35,000, which was previously being uh, previously acquired for 13,000. So I can change this even to 55,000. First thing that you have noticed in that I have been able to involve, involve a relationship. Son is related to Mr. A, Mr. A is supposed to be a father and making a disposal of the asset to his son at a price pretty much less than to the market, less than the half of the 55,000. The half of the 55,000 has to be 27,500, 27,500. And the asset was sold to son at a price way, way, way less than to the market value on the date of sale happens because to whom the asset was sold out to son. When an asset is sold out to a connected party, 
relative to whom you are in connection with brother daughter father sister wife uh you, you try to sell it up at the price less than to market it applies to our life also when you try to sell up your asset to someone in your family you 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 do not consider to make a lot of profit out of that transaction you you try to take a care of that and give your family member a favor of buying it at a price that's less than to market but when the same asset you will try to sell it in the market you you will try to achieve the price as high as possible you must have to agree with that let's be honest the same has happened over here what has been the market value 55 if the father has sold this asset to someone random in the market would have definitely sold for 55000 or a value that's close to as possible to 55000 but because he was selling this asset to his son being sold up for how much 25000 and this will create a problem because according to the normalities we will come to record the cash over here because in a disposal transaction we have just learned in a case of disposal we have to take a cash proceed so i will be able to take the cash proceeds to calculate me the balance of gain but this creates a problem especially for a tax authority because the tax authority they will mind it imagine the same asset was being sold for 55000 what amount of gain would have recognized 55 minus 13 52 42000 and that person would have paid tax on this much amount of gain it reduces the gain by a massive and as a result of that taxes will be saved and tax authority will mind it understanding the whole practicality of so on top of computations are going on try to make the use of your mind also that as a result of actual transaction the gains have substantially been reduced and as a result of that what will happen and authority will mind that a lot and if the transaction was done on commercial terms market value if had been used this is the amount of the gain would have been assessed surely would have ended up paying greater amount of tax which is not been the case so to prevent this to happen the authority requires us to do what to make an assumption while computing market value will have to be used for the purpose of computing the gains when connection is involved later i will come to explain who is in connection to me now how many parties i can take it into my connection but the rule of law is whenever the sale of an asset being done to a connected party no matter what you have done actually you still can sell it even at a loss that's your personal transaction your money your son your asset you sell it at loss but when it comes to the computation of market value will be used so that the gains will be assessed according to market and taxes in that case will not be saved that is what you have to remember it now from this case the only last thing that i've left to explain now is to whom i'm in connection to how many parties i can take into my connection son is one of the connected party but there are plenty more have you understood the whole thing to prevent this to happen the rule has been made that whenever the asset being sold out to a connected party actual cash proceeds will be ignored and will be replaced with market value so that the gains will be worked based on to the commercial terms and taxes will not be saved to whom i am in connection do you can look onto this chart connect is parties chart this is a tax payer and see on the left and right side on the top and the bottom all of the connections are there spouse is definitely going to be an immediate connection to that person the civil partner the partner the word probably has been hidden somewhere in editing 
like you can see civil partners a spouse or maybe a civil partner is an immediate connection to any person spouse is the most closest person to uh, any person and their children their grandchildren their parents and their grandchildren parents as you can see the chart children grandchildren parents and grandparents siblings of the taxpayer and siblings of even the spouses this chart takes all of those connections around the taxable person but rest assured you will not be challenged much on that that you will be sitting it in exam hall for 10 20 minutes thinking of is it a connection to me or not like lots of first cousin third cousin fifth cousin uncle aunt they have included in so you'll be worried now do i take them into connection or not usually what is there in question easy connections brother sister father mother wife daughter son immediate connections will be there for you not to be confused about am i supposed to take them into connection or not convinced so that is the chart of connected party and this is what i was explaining to all of you usually takes proceeds but market value in two instances we have to take both i have been able to explain the first one in which an asset was gifted to anyone else and in the second case, when it has been sold up to a connected party, within which it's the law that requires us to use this law requires us to consider market value instead of cash proceeds. Just a part of that has been finished and you can see the way I take my course forward. Never, I have the habit of reading this whole text in advance. I always come back to reveal it after I'm done explaining it first. And that way, you find yourself in a comfortable state to read that all. If I had asked you to read that before, you would have not even bothered to read that from that part of the screen. You would have been rather sitting and watching and not getting anything out. But now when you will read it, I'm 101% sure you, you, you will have that sense and you will be having that feeling, okay, I know all of that, that normally we have to take cash. But in the case of gifting, market value I have to take. In the case of connection, market value I have to take because I have just been explained by taking three examples by the lecturer within which the first one was the cash consideration. The second one was the gift. So the market value was involved. The third one was the connection. So the market. So this way, the courses will go by. These lecture notes, they will become so easy to go with. After I'm done with the talk, then I have a tendency to reveal it. Even if I do not, you're not missing anything out, but I have a habit of making it show on the screen, bringing it up so that you know what's being there, it's covered before we move forward. So that's the end of the first component of this first performer we're done with. Usually takes cash in a normal transaction of sale, but when the asset was rather gifted, we have no choice but to take a market value. This is a straightforward case because in the case of gift, you have no choice but to take a market value. Yeah, in case of connection, you have a chance of making a mistake because in the case of connection, the cash will be given to us. And you rather have to ignore it and take the market value instead can be a problem if you will not pay attention. Convinced? No problem. Connected parties, I also have told you, not you will be tested on that kind of connection that will be confused that to take into connection or not brother sister daughter father son these sort of connections will be there what's next incidental cost of disposal certain things do not require to have too much of paperwork they can just be talked about like this what is incidental cost of disposal a cost that is incurred in relation to a transaction of disposal. Else this cost 
would have not incurred. Incidental to sale. Examples can be discounts. Discount is a cost to a seller. And you incur it only when you sell. Else you don't. Then, uh, auctioner fees. Well, you, the, the auction is, the process of auction is conducted with the idea of selling. So all of the expense that you have incurred while auctioning, this cost would have been saved totally if you were never selling. Valuation fees. You try to value an asset with the purpose of getting the value and then selling. So valuation fees is a selling cost. Uh, then you can have a transportation cost. You have may have to deliver it from your own premises to buyer's premises. This cost would have totally been saved if you had not sold. But think of your accounting courses also alongside selling cost. That all of those costs, those are incurred only because of the reason of the transaction of sale, else these costs would have been saved. It's the incidental cost of disposal. Agency commission also can be there. You hire an agency who helps you out in selling your assets. So you pay a commission 5% of the sale price. It's another example of incidental cost. Okay with that? And that's on the top of the next page being written. Cost incurred in making that sale possible. For example, stage and commission, valuation fees. I already have given you these examples. So certain elements are there. Which they do not require to have any sort of paperwork. You just read them off and you move forward. Like this one. What do I have to explain more on that incidental cost? Examples. Try to keep it that into your mind because these examples will itself come to explain in return what, what sort of cost these are. Delivery cost, advertisement cost, legal expenses, auctioner fees, valuation fees, estate in commission. These costs would only incur attached to the transaction of sale else would never be. This is not the discussion actually. This is something that you, after minusing this incidental cost out of disposal, you get the balance of net disposal proceeds. So that does not have any definition. Or you just can remember it. After deducting the incidental cost of disposal, the proceeds is said to be as net disposal proceeds, like gross minus expenses equals to net profit. So it's like that. Did you see that gradually we have started from the top and now moving towards the bottom. And what's coming to our way, we are trying to finish it off. Well, the next talk will require us to have a bit of a time spending so I can once again take the time out and explain the next co component, which is cost of acquisition. Things at this point are too basic. We've just started the course, uh, the course of tax. Long way to go. But mind you, if you will not respect these basics, never the advanced aspects will be kind to you. Because I always say to students, these basics of the course, they are a gateway to advanced aspects. And if you have not found that gate right, you will never be able to enter yourself into those complex aspects uh, if you're not done with this. So you have to equally respect this starting point of the course. Because many things we have planned to do in many next sessions based on the discussion of the course of today. And you will realize it soon. Let this course to go forward by three to four sessions further. Every little thing that's been shared up till now is becoming a base of lots of advanced things we are planning to do at later stage. So keep on learning, keep on respecting, and pay attention to. So cost of acquisition usually takes what? Purchase price. Usually it takes a purchase price. Usually it takes the purchase price. And no wonder. You go to acquire any item. The price that you pay becomes what? The cost of acquisition. Is it or not? 
imagine the laptop that I'm working on, the class that I'm conducting it on and using it for my administrative purposes. If I have acquired this by paying $1,000, but that's the price that I have paid, becomes what? The acquisition cost of this laptop. So it, it's something that it's too obvious to start off with, but still I start off by making the first most basic case because it's not going to be a purchase price all the times. Commonly, purchase price, but we have some possibilities. Like you have seen that for disposal proceeds, commonly a cash balance, but occasionally it can be a market value. And especially in the case of connection market value, the same way it usually takes the purchase price, but it can occasionally take some other possibilities with the time to come, I will talk. Take this example where this is Mr. A and this is B. The alphabet B comes after A, so I'm, 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 I'm trying to follow it. hypothetical examples because I'm making it. So I go like this. Sometimes I write it as X, Y, Z. Sometimes I write it as element. One of the party being the seller, the other one being the buyer. This party has been able to sell off this asset to Mr. B. Asset sold, or rather, I use the word preferably disposed. B in this case are Mr. B. This is our side, and we are buying an asset from Mr. A by paying the price of whatever he has charged. So, Mr. A required us to pay 10,000 for this, which he has acquired it in the past for 3,000. This is the gain we've been able to assess on his side. We're not interested. We're interested in what more? We ourselves in this case is Mr. B. And we're acquiring an asset. For how much? 10,000. So this is the cost of an acquisition to us, which in return is a price that we have paid in acquiring this asset. Is it or not? Well, this is the price that we have paid in acquiring. This is the purchase price of that asset that we have paid in acquiring. So it should become what? A cost of acquisition of ours. That tomorrow I go and sell this off to someone else. I'll be using this. Let's do that. I suppose this asset being sold up to someone else tomorrow. When I say tomorrow, I don't mean to say tomorrow, literally Sunday. I mean to say any time later. Lots of times I will be making an assumption of this way. So you do not have to take me saying tomorrow as the reason of tomorrow. Literally, any time later, can be tomorrow also, but any year next to that, two years after, 10 years after, 20 years after, Mr. B came to sell off this asset to someone else. Someone else has to be C after B, the C comes. So it has to be C. It has been sold to Mr. C. Like I said, literally tomorrow, maybe 10 years after, five years after, or how much it has been sold up for randomly for 17,000. When the Mr. B will come to make the use of that cost, what he will go to use that being the part of cost of acquisition. He will go to check back his records and he will be like, I have paid this much of price when this was being acquired in the past. So in order to compute the gain of my side today, I'll be able to fix it in. So key thing to that, you have to notice it that the purchase price becomes a part of cost of acquisition, usually for the purpose of computing the gain for later disposals. This 10,000 is the price the B has paid to acquire it. Tomorrow when he sells this off to someone else, same turned out to be the cost of acquisition for the purpose of computing the gain. Too obvious. But still, like I said, we will have some other possibilities to learn. So before we go to learn the other possibilities, we try to go with the basic case first so that we can easily convert shift transfer ourselves to that exception okay with that tell me any wrong anything that you feel confused about you have to write me into a chat box within the live session 
if the issue is not that long, I can immediately reply back and comment. But if it is a little more time taking, it relates to your personal uh, understanding of or non-understanding of topic. You can come back to reach me on WhatsApp afterwards in a WhatsApp group also or directly to my WhatsApp. Just don't let that thing go for any later stage. That time will never come. Every next week, we meet up for the next topics. Topics keeps on piling. The problems will keep on piling. You will never find the time to come back to reach me for that. Try to resolve that thing within that week by yourself, six days the next. This is a better way of learning. Especially early part of the days when you're trying to when you're trying really hard in the start to really get yourself used to up with this new type of um, course today that never you have experienced it before. So you have to come back to ask me, how is it that? this? Or if I do some arithmetical problem, you also can correct me. I've been doing lots of hypothetical assumptions. It can happen that I may have punched some figure wrongly somewhere. So you always come to correct me so that it should not be an inconvenience for the others later when they download the file and they will try to view the document and they'll be confused how this figure has arrived. Help everyone else around in the group, within the class, so that all of us, we have got the same mission to take ourselves to the June exam and attempt it and pass. It's the same ship and we are all the passengers of have to help each other in this cause. Are you done with this one basic case? I myself is B, acquiring an asset by paying the price 10,000. With tomorrow, when I will go to sell this off to someone else, I will be using the same price being the part of my cost of acquisition for the purpose of computing the gain. Let's try to bring now an exception. Let's try to copy and paste this entire performer and so that I can bring the change into it. So what is that change coming in? Let's rub off all of the figures on the first. And yeah, good. So Mr. A this time making a gift of an asset to Mr. B. That is a change. It's not a sale transaction, it's a gift transaction. Good with this. This asset was being acquired by A in the past for same 3000. But when it was gifted, the market value of an asset was what? Market value of an asset was, market value of an asset was 9000 randomly. You should not be forgetting it from my previous talk that whenever an asset is gifted, this one, from the perspective of seller or the one who has gifted, you must have to take the market value for the sake of computing the gain. So let's keep on applying that. This asset was rather gifted by A to B. So as far as the A's perspective is concerned, I must have to use the market value for the purpose of calculating his gain. Now, this has been an assumption in the books of A as a sale proceeds. Actually, he hasn't received that. Same way, this assumption will continue in the books of buyer, which we know that he hasn't paid it. Neither of the party has paid it nor received it. But once we have been making an assumption of 9,000 in the books of seller to be the balance of proceeds, the same assumption will continue to be the cost in the books of buyer, like in this case. So the reason why I was explaining to you all of that basic case first, whatever the proceeds you see on the one side turns out to be the cost for buyer. Don't understand that? Simple example, you go to buy anything from mall, may it be a small item. Whatever the price that you pay to you, it must have been a what? A cost price. But from seller, it is what? A sale price. So figure is same. Seller treats the same value as sale price. You treat the same value to be as cost price. So from buyer's perspective, it's a cost price. From the seller's perspective, it's a sale price. So when we have done this thing over, the same logic 
will continue to apply over all so. While the truth is, neither of the party has paid it nor received it. But we are making an assumption as if this has been the balance of proceeds the A has collected. So that assumption will continue as if the B has paid. So what that 9,000 in reality is, it's a market value of the gift date. Tomorrow, when B comes to sell this asset to someone else, he will go to take whatever his record suggests. His record suggests as if this is the price that he has paid in acquiring and I will be coming to fix that out over here. So what now has become a part of the cost of acquisition? Market value of gift. The task becomes easy to understand when you've understood this whole cycle first. It becomes so easy to understand. This 9,000, never been the case, was actually paid by me to someone. But my record suggests as if I have paid this, so I'm supposed to use that being the part of cost of action for tomorrow disposals. The same thing can become very difficult to understand if you will not understand this case by case. The text course is all about this. Questions and questions will questions and lots of illustrations will let you understand that topic by all of its dimensions. You have one example, a straightforward one. Now this one is the second one, brings in some confusions. But if you have got this one done, you easily can compare with that. You got it? So B. The records of the B suggest as if this is the price that he has paid in acquiring this asset, which in reality, if you ask, he hasn't paid anything. But the record of this suggests now he has paid this much, which in fact is the market value of an asset on the date of gift. Tomorrow when he will sell this off to someone else, whatever the price he would sell this off, the same cost will be become a part of his cost of acquisition for the purpose of computing the gain. So in reality, the cost of acquisition now has taken the market value of the gift to work the gain. So usually it takes the purchase price, but can take the market value and you've seen it. That's the talk. We are having it from here for the cost of acquisition. It usually consists the purchase price. Purchase cost will be used when an asset was purchased previously, where the price paid for an asset becomes a part of purchase cost. It is a normal case, but market value, when an asset was acquired as a result of gift previously, where the market value of the asset on the date of gift will then be used. If you will try to just read this text, they will have no connection to this example behind you will always be lost and will be wondering what's written. But after taking the example, number one, catering this, example number two, catering this, you will still have a better chance to coop up with the topic. Getting it right? So cost of acquisition usually takes price, the one that's been paid previously while acquiring an asset. But previously, if an asset was being acquired as a result of gift, actually the price was never paid, then we will have to come and replace this with the market value of an asset on the date of gift. And you people have seen the whole process of that in this example, how? Within that section, the last thing is to take a probate value. Well, what is a probate value? Nothing. If the overall arrangement, I make an assumption, has been happening it on the death of individual. Suppose Mr. A today has died. And by a will, the assets are gifted 
to be inheritance we call it as gift on as uh, on death is called as inheritance mr a makes the gift of this asset to be on his death via will so the market value on that day spotted is rather called as probate value so just the word m has to be changed which p nothing else will change gift in the life or gift on the death gift is a gift so once i have explained to all of you the process of gift in the life of a person the same will be done on the death just need to respect that the market value of an asset on the death day should not be called as market value rather being called as what probate value that only is the difference the difference of term but not the difference of case so that will not make me to make another example you have to adjust yourself with that if mr a today dies and makes the transfer of asset to b when the market value of the asset being found out to be as 9000 so this market value will rather be called as probate value so wherever the word m has been used you just have to change that to p probate value nothing else will change convinced so that's the end of this cost of acquisition and we are heading towards further down to the bottom as we are done with the cost of acquisition also while incidental cost of acquisition takes the same flavor as above this time the incidental cost was in relation to disposal transaction this time it's in relation to acquisition so same talk will come back to our way if the if if i have paid any extra cost over and above to the purchase price for example legal cost transportation cost this will be incidental to the transaction of acquisition so i will have to top this up in as you can see that this notes writes it includes any other costs incurred on the purchase of an asset such as delivery cost legal cost or any other cost that they've incurred over and above to the purchase price they have paid an enhancement expenditure you have the accounting basics with you you know that capital expenditures are capitalized such as enhancement of an asset extension to an asset improvement so any sort of enhancements being done any sort of extensions being done will be capitalized enhancement expenditure such as improvement expenditure in shape of extension so your building is a two story building when it was initially constructed but now has become a four story building because you just have built extra two stories so constructing the extra two stories is a extension cost and will be capitalized in the existing cost of two story building it's purely an accounting thing you know that what i'm talking about enhancement expenditures are always capitalized may it be in the shape of extension improvement or enhancement we capitalize them yeah the cost like repair and maintenance cannot be capitalized enhancement costs are that means after completing our talk we are somewhere lying in the middle of this performa and till that point what we have done we have got the questions coming to our way let's have a bit of a stop over over here before moving into the second half of that performa we can work two questions on the way before moving on to the rest of the part these questions are topic specific whatever the part of the topic that we have finished we will be able to easily easily revise they want us to calculate the capital gains on the sale of the house so this question is nothing except picking the figures and plotting them back in a performa till the level we have finished till that point and you will see it nothing is so troubling in on 1st of july sam sold a house to her sister for 35000 pound this is the balance of cash proceeds the market value on the day was 80000 pound sam had acquired the villa back in 2017 for 29000 pound that must have been the cost of acquisition price paid the legal fee on acquisition is incidental cost in relation to acquisition 
well the estate agent fee for the sales total now, state agent fee for the sales total is incidental cost of disposal and that is an enhancement cost the room was added adding a room is not a repair cost it's not a maintenance cost it's enhancement so like i said this question is nothing except we have to come and revise the whole performer and we can do that just to gain a bit of a momentum before taking ourselves down to the second half of this performa. So I'll start myself off with the uh, um, gross disposal proceeds. We might be using this performa for the next question also. So let's try to uh, construct it a little more formally. Gross disposal proceeds. Then comes the incidental cost. The one that is in relation to disposal, so I can write that next to it, that disposal. Uh, we will have the cost of acquisition. And then we have incidental cost. The one that is in relation to acquisition. And then we have uh, the extension cost or enhancement cost. Well, let's have to plug in the figures. The cost of acquisition is given as 29,000. Nothing is so troubling in it. The incidental cost of acquisition is given next to that is 800. While the incidental cost of disposal is given as, as, as 5,000. There is an enhancement cost adding the room for 15,000 a pound. And yeah, the proceeds, I'm a little reluctant to fix it in something very important over here. If someone can highlight uh, in the chat box, what is so special about this application number two? I have been able to stop myself. Someone has just written me into a chat box. Some more replies are coming in. Yeah. Right, both of you, those, those, they replied me. Connection is involved. Some more replies are coming to me in private. Yeah. Good, you're right. Most of you are right. Those, they have responded, five, six of you. Yes. This way, the question will bring in the connection. You will never be told by a question that, okay, this is a connection or the word connection will not be used. Rather, you will you will you will have to go a little slowly on that okay to whom the asset yeah. was sold out to sister oh yeah that's connection so i am going to apply something important over here and see the same problem to whom asset being sold out to a sister it's just about thirty five thousand. when in the market the same value worth more than the double of thirty five thousand. see the same problem you will end up using thirty five thousand over here on the day of exam and feeling it like that you have done everything so right but ultimately, we lose the marks. And this is where the examiner is going to check you on. And that's what you're here to learn. And I'm fully making you aware of that, highlighting it, having a pause over here, involving you in it. Connection is involved. Market value, we will have to come and use, which is an assumption, not the reality. Reality is 35,000. But for the sake of computing the gain, that needs to be done. Market value. Okay with that. Yes, the calculators work 80,000 minus 5,000 minus 2,900, 29,000 minus 800 minus 15,000. The figure turns up to be 30200. Good going. That is a capital gain. Uh, we've been able to work. If you have to reach me for any topic issues of the classes, I can tell you on weekends, it's difficult for me to reply back. 
because on on Saturday I'm I'm packed with courses also on Sunday. So when I'm into the live course, obviously I cannot check my cell phone and answer. Understood. So even in morning, you your cl class in the afternoon, but I have I, I start the day with SPR in the morning. 8 a.m. 8 in the morning, and then followed by I have SFR afterwards. Taxation is always in the last. So even you try to send me anything in the morning or afterwards, I may not be able to reply because when I'm into the live courses, I cannot just look onto my cell phone. I keep getting the notifications, but I really cannot go back to and reply them since I lose my focus. I cannot even reply it to the person who has required my help in this case. So I just take out of that my cell phone zone on Saturdays and Sundays. Weekday, uh, in the daytime, I'm available. Since I'm not taking the live courses, whatever I'm doing it other than that, at least in that case, I can use my cell phone to reply. And similarly, in the weekdays, I'm, I'm busy on evenings. On Tuesday evenings, I'm busy with the live course. On Wednesday evening, I'm busy with the live course. And occasionally on Thursday also, not permanently. Occasionally, I have a course. <laughs> So in case you send me the message to seek my help in this time, I'm, I'm letting you in advance that I will not be able to instantly reply. Keep that in mind so that you won't feel bad about that the lecture is not responsive, not reaching me back for me of my concern. So I just had to clarify this thing, few things. Um, little bits I can help. Like if someone has not been able to join, so to let that person in, I have used my cell phone to respond it back. And, and helped it. But topic issues, if someone has, or some other issues, if someone is also paying me for the courses, taking the admissions, I'm not taking them in because it takes me a bit of a time to give them the access, sending the emails to them. They will be registered for the next week now. Some of their payments are still pending. To some students, I still have to send the links for the payment. All work will be done once I'm, I'm, I finish my day at seven. So letting you know about the whole of the system works. I try to keep it in mind also that on top of I deal with the administrative side of the course, I have to be in to my life courses. And in that case, strictly, I cannot respond it back to any sort of queries that you have before the session and after. Let's go to attempt the next question, which is of the same kind. The question requires us to calculate the capital gains arising on the sale of the both of the assets. Oh no, we have two assets now. That's a good question that will make you understand how to make the use of uh, the one space and to fit in the both assets together within. John sold the house for 100,000 pound on 15th of June. Fine. Cost is given. Extended it at a cost of 70,000. The estate agent and the solicitor fee for the purchase total 1500 So it's 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 like the same we have done before. They provided us with the incidental cost of purchase sale, extension cost, acquisition cost, proceeds. He also sold his grandfather's watch for £20,000. He had inherited the watch on the death of his father, grandfather back in 2021 when the watch was valued for £13,000. So it was gifted to him on the death of his grandfather, which is called as inherited. The gift on death is called as inherited. Otherwise, it's a gift. And this value that they've given to us, in fact, is called as probate value. So the market value of an asset on the day of death is called as probate value. It's a market value, but it's rather called as probate value. So I'll have to make the two columns. One will be for house. The second one will be watch. And easily we can work another answer to make our old self comfortable before we move on to the second half of that performa, that will be after a break. But before going to the break of 15 minutes, let's try to finish it off. House and watch. House and the watch. Uh, can I take the help of that performa? Surely I can. This will save me a lot of time. All of those narratives, I can come down to write it, copy and paste it. We'll save a lot of our time for this. Yes, it's quite a bit of a time saving.
Okay, focusing on the one thing first. House being sold up for how much? 100,000. Being acquired for how much? 45,000. Uh, incidental cost of acquisition is, oh, let's take the room extension first, 70,000. Let's take the bigger portions of the cost. And then we have the incidental cost, which I have to seeking it for purchase, it's 1,500. And for the sales, it's 3,500. So 1,500 will come over here. 3,500 will come over here. That's the end of the first one. And then comes the watch. For how much the watch has been sold out for? 20,000. And how come he has acquired that watch in the past? A gift from his grandfather. He hasn't paid any actual price for that. He was rather gifted. So the day the asset was gifted, the day was a debt. And the value of that day is called as the market value, probate value, which is what we will be coming to use that being the part of his cost of acquisition on an assumption basis. Remember that talk, we have had it in this example, that how come later the cost of acquisition comes to take that market value. You people have seen the whole nice talk of that. Now, in this case, let's assume this is grandfather and this is grandson. The name of the grandson is John. So this is grandfather and there comes the John. The watch was gifted to him. This is the market value of the watch on the day of death, which now has become a part of the cost of acquisition for John, which tomorrow when he sells this off to someone else, the same cost he will be able to use it, which in fact right now is called as probate value. These are the small cases, but they're worth understanding. They will make the life of yours very easier to move forward. This 13,000 was never the price that he has paid in acquiring that watch. It was in fact the probate value the day the watch was inherited to him becomes the part of the cost of acquisition for the sake of computing the gain for disposals and which was which is something that we've made the use of that. Side will give us the total of what 15,000, uh, 17,000 plus 45,000, that's going to be 52,000, 62,000, 62,000 plus 5,000, 67, it's going to be 33,000. So we, we finished ourselves with this much proportion of that performa, and we, we can say that we've gained a comfort of how one should have to draw and fix in the figures in before taking ourselves down to the second half. And here we will take a break for 15 minutes. Once I come to resume the session, we will come to talk about with the rest of the part of this performa. So stay tuned. Do not go anywhere. I will see you in about 15 minutes to continue the course.
Okay, I'm back hoping you're also there with me in the continuation of the course of today. <clears throat> yeah, in the continuation of this performer, one thing that needs to understand is we're studying finance act 23 you know that everywhere the course has been advertised you probably have seen this title fa 23 finance act 23 and according to Finance Act 23, the tax year that we are considering is 23-24. This tax year is the basis of assessment for individuals. Just the way accounting has its own year end, financial year. This is the financial year of tax. It starts on a 6th of April and ends on 5th of April. So if it starts on 23, ends on 24. These are the fixed dates of a tax year 23-24 applicable to our exam sitting. The explanation of that is not been done in this chapter, has been done somewhere else. But I had just come to um, write it in the first course rather to wait it for little. Applicable to the question that we have done recently, how can I relate the gain that we have worked relates to one particular tax year by focusing on to the date of disposal? We look on to the date of disposal, which in this case was what? The day this asset was disposed was 1st of July, 2023. So I simply have to come and check this out if the date of disposal falls into a tax year or not. And if it falls, which in this case is falling, I will go to assess the gains of this much into this tax year and be labeling it as that this is the gain that will become a part of tax year 23-24. So to which tax year the gain has to be assessed in, the gain has to be recognized in totally depends on the date of disposal. So we must have to pay attention to the date of disposal in that question to see to which text that it belongs to and we go to record the whole gain in. This can be done for the next one. This disposal transaction takes place on 15th of June 2023. So I go to label it onto a top 15th of June 2023. While the next one disposes of on the, the same day, they have not mentioned. So the, both the disposals being taken place on the same day and looks to me have fallen into the same tax year that we are in. Can you see that? 15th of June, 2023 belongs to this tax year. So I will go to assess the both of those gains in the tax year. And this makes me to finally add the both. And the reason why I was coming to explain this to all of you, that do we have to add the two figures? The answer is now with you. Only and only if, if they belong to same tax year, then we will add, else we will not. Because can happen, one disposal may have been assessed in the last tax year, other will assess into this one. So you cannot just forcefully add the two. Only when both they belong to same tax year, then you will be like the gain that belongs to this tax year is 40,000. Convinced? Okay with that. Moving forward, discussion in regards to the exemptions and reliefs. Now, this is that discussion which we will have to put this a little on hold. And we will come to land ourselves on this in chapter number 17, 18, 19, 20. We will come to learn 
the reliefs and exemptions in chapter 20. So till then, have to put this on a hold. I have been able to write the same thing on the top of this page even. The reliefs and exemptions are available on the sale or maybe the replacement or the gift of certain assets which are discussed later in the notes. And later, I already have told you, it's chapter 20. So wherever I go to refer something, I will go to give you a proper guidance. I will refer it so that you'll be aware of when this will be finished. Let's continue this journey further bottom down to by taking the losses of discussion losses into a discussion capital losses so the next discussion is in regards to capital loss the next discussion is in regards to capital loss and what i can do i can take this question as a reference to continue with because i can see two columns there in and i can establish the two cases down below the case number one, we have a house. And the case number two, we have uh, the second one is watch. So randomly, I can write the figure of what down below. Uh, I can write this figure as 1000. And I can write this figure as 300. Negative. Can happen or not? Don't you prepare a profit and loss at times and you end up getting the loss? Can happen for the disposal transaction where the proceeds, they fall short of the cost. So in one column, you have a loss. In the one, you have a gain. And this is by the definition is what we call it as by the definition what we call it as capital loss this is what we call it as capital loss as it is really a loss and which text here are we into right now so the loss that arises in the current text here that we are in right now is called as current year capital loss so how easily gradually i'm trying to label it that this is called as current year capital loss as this is the loss of capital and has arrived in a tax year that we are currently in so it's called as current year capital loss for text have to try and offset it have to try and offset it against the capital gains arising in the same tax year mind you it has to be for same tax year first so when i will go to offset it will absorb everything which means the net amount of capital gains that will be assessed into tax year 23 24 is going to be 700 this is called as net capital gains this is called as net capital gain Okay with that. Now let's switch it the other way around. Let's assume that this is the figure of the loss and this is the figure of the gain, what we have to do. That is a case number two. Let's go to construct it and see what we have to do it under. Case number two. Let's rub off and try to amend it according to Uh, that is a case number two. Okay. Now we have this loss and this turns out to be a positive one. Once again, this will be called as, this will be called as capital loss undoubtedly. And because this is the loss that has arrived in the current year I'm into, so I would be calling it as current year capital loss. And I have the same job to do. I'll have to offset it against the capital gains arising into a same tax year, which is what I am. This is what I'm doing that. What is going on? So 
So when we are going to offset it, what is the maximum amount of the loss that I can set this off against the 300? So in this case, this will be called as current year capital loss. The portion of the loss that we've been able to relieve in a current tax year is called as the current year capital loss. And the portion of the loss that we could not relieve is 700. This is what we call it as brought forward capital loss. The portion of the loss that we could not relieve is called as the brought forward capital loss. Brought forward capital loss. And what needs to be done with that? Do we have the chance of relieving this loss by any way? Yes. This is that portion of the loss which we will have to carry it forward. Carry forward to offset it against the capital gains of the future tax year. Of the future tax years. Carry forward to offset it against the capital gains of the future tax years. How many number of years we can carry it forward? Adding it next to indefinite or infinite. Countless number of years we can carry it forward. But we must have to make sure to offset it against the capital gains of future tax years. The portion of the loss that we've been able to relieve against the capital gains of the same tax year is called as current year capital loss, but the portion that we could not relieve brought forward. Total is 1,000. 300 being labeled as current, 700 being labeled as brought forward. This is the amount of the loss that we have to send it to the next tax year to try and relieve it against the capital gains of the next tax year. And, and I have a question in which I can come to demonstrate how will this be carried forward and relieved. All of this talk has been written there. The loss that arises on the disposal of the assets in the current tax year is known as current year capital loss, and they have to offset it against the capital gain arising in the same, 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 same tax year. As you can see me offsetting it against the column next to. Then we will have to carry it forward for the indefinite number of years to set the sum off against the capital gains of future. Losses of the previous tax years are known as brought forward losses. And we have to offset them up by carrying them forward against the profit, uh, the capital gains of the next tax year for infinite number of years. See, any unbelief can still be carried forward to set it off against the future tax years net capital gains. And this task, we know that is always infinite. A little discussion in regards to annual exemption. Let's finish it on to the way. And then we will go into a question on the losses, which will take the losses and the exemptions both together in. So annual exemption. We are about to touch the bottom of this performer. We are about to touch the bottom of this performer annual exemption. what is this annual exemption? Suppose you have worked the game, sale proceeds. Less the cost. And the gain. So I can make an assumption. Uh, the proceeds are 10,000. No, not 10,000. I can take that as 20,000. The cost is 5,000. So this is the gain that we've been able to assess. To make these gains taxable, we have been given an exemption annually. The limit of that is 6,000. This is a tax-free lump sum amount available to each taxpayer in each tax year once. And this makes the gains tax ready now and we can come to apply the rates of taxes too. 
This limit is fixed for tax year 23, 24 and will never be given to us in the questions. You will have to remember it and make the use of it by yourself. To make the gains taxable, it needs to be deducted. Fixed, it was quite a huge one in last tax year, 12,300. But being reduced down to almost or less than even the half of that last year's annual exemption, but the exemption thing keeps on changing. For this tax, it's going to be 6,000. This is the amount that we were supposed to pay a tax. But that is the amount we will end up. So quite a relief to a taxpayer in bringing the level of the gains down by 6,000 pounds. That is the whole operation of this annual exemption. What if the gains are not plenty to absorb we can make lots of cases to understand. That's the way of learning. Let's make the two further cases within which I can try to let's take this amount up to where seventeen thousand. This becomes three thousand. So this time I will be able to subtract the maximum of what the amount of the gains that I have above, the portion of the annual exemption that we would have, would have not been relieved, it's called as unrelieved annual exemption. What is that amount? Can we do anything further out of that? No, it's going to be a big waste. Cannot do anything about it. Any amount of exemption that we could not possibly relieve in that tax year, it's a because each year has got its own exemption, cannot be carried forward. Like the way the losses can be, exemptions cannot be. Any amount of the exemption that's not been relieved is a waste. Maximum, what we can subtract is the amount of the gains, those are there available to absorb, which is 3,000. Clarified? What if? We have two disposals going on together, like this one. Uh, or I can make one more example where I have an asset one, I have an asset two. Both of the disposals being taken place in the same tax year. So I've got proceeds, got cost. The proceeds are 15,000, proceeds are 13,000. The cost is 5,000 and the cost is 4,000. So we've got 10,000 over here and we've got 9,000 over here. Now, to make these gains taxable, I am I'm going to subtract an annual exemption for one more time. And if you were confused and if you have got any sort of misconception of this kind, take that out. Because annually, it's once available. And our job is to find the total of the gains so that we can deduct that amount once this is the right treatment. So it's annually once available, regardless of the fact you have disposed five assets within that same tax year. So you pull up the gains and then in the end come to subtract this amount one off. These are the things that if you talk about this thing in air, you will have no chance of getting the better taste or uh, in a way that you can apply it by yourself later on. But when you people have been given a demonstration of everything, like that is the most normal, common way of using that annual exemption. In case if it is less, the gains are not plenty. So... That is what you have to do. You have listened to that. You have learned it. It has become a part of your whiteboard explanation. And then over and above to what if you've got two assets being disposed into a same tax year. You people have seen that. So lots of questions that a student can have it in a mind before you have to come and ask. I come to try and make lots of cases. which serves the purpose of that. I hope I'm right on. If you have got this thing coming to your mind, 
I've already clarified. Or if you have got this thing coming to your mind, I've already clarified. And everything has become a part of your board explanation in simple um, um, handwriting. You will find it so easy to then connect this whole talk with what's been written back into lecture notes because I've explained every bit of it. Let's see, what is annual exemption? Tax-free exemption. One exemption is available on all disposals that you people have seen in my one of the example where you clearly have been demonstrated with the idea of using once 6,000 against the total. That is a limit for this tax year. And then it comes to talk about that, okay, it cannot be carried forward to take any advantage if any part of the exemption is not used in that tax year. What's so new in these four or five bullet points that you will be wishing to learn? And when you will come to read that part, or you will be so comfortable feeling it like that you know all about because all of the board work and the hardship has been done to explain every bit of it. And even if you do not come to read this, you're not missing it out anything. This how the way by the time the course finishes off, you realize that your whole lecture is decorated and noted. Do you see any corner of this chapter that's not been highlighted, underlined or colored? Gradually, you feel it like, oh, we've touched every corners of it and we have finished it. The first lecture of the today is the true representation of what's being planned for the next 20 to 25 session, the next four months. Let's go and attempt the application number four, which requires us to make the use of the knowledge that we have just learned for the losses, capital and the current and the brought forward with the annual exemption to be also used together within. Calculate the taxable gain for A and B for both the tax year 23, 24 and 20 to 23 and the amount of any losses being carried forward. Question number four, application four, it says for tax year 22, 23 and 20. Application four, what it says? 22, 23, 23, 24. Where, where is exactly the mistake? Typing mistake. First sentence. Yeah. Yeah. Also, sometimes if you find a bit of a typing mistake somewhere, just someone has corrected, I'm more welcome to take that because these notes, like I told you, are updated based on to the newer Finance Act. So even after being done with so many times of proofreading happens once or twice at some way the year uh, may have not been corrected right so it's good that someone once corrects it becomes visible to everyone around and you actually keep the note of that at, at your side also so it was not 20 to 23 it was 23 24 and everywhere else it's fine it's fine everywhere else Accept this point. Thank you. Okay, there are two persons in it, A and B. And we have to take the case of the both of those two cases separate. Let's concentrate on Mr. A first. And they're providing us with the data of Mr. A, 22, 23 tax year, 23, 24 tax year. So let's get on with Mr. A. Uh, this is application number four. So this is Mr. A. And with Mr. A to go by, I have to take the tax years on a chronological order. Starts off at 22, 23 tax year first. And then we will take 23, 24 after two. Yeah, let's paste all of that stuff in capital gains, allowable losses. 
We'll start off with capital gains. And next to that, we have capital losses. So in which tax year are we into right now? 22, 23. So the loss that has arrived in this tax year is called as current year capital loss of that tax year. The gains are 20,000. The losses are 16,000. So this is the figure that we've been able to get 4,000. This is called as net capital gains. This is called as net capital gain. This is called as net capital gain. We will have an annual exemption to make a use of, which in this case, the maximum that we can use is 4,000. Since we know that 6,000 is the amount, but we can use the maximum of that figure is. So I can try to copy and paste this entire performer, even for the next text here, just to save a bit of a time. There you go. This is text here, 23, 24. The figures I have to rub off. And then we can take the rest of the stuff. 30,000 has been the figure of the gain. 14,000 has been the figure of the loss. This makes me to work the gain of 16,000. And happily, the exemption can be deducted fully. So this is what they've asked us to do for Mr. A. And we've done. Mr. A uh, did not have any loss, uh, brought forward loss, because all of the loss has been relieved. So nothing was being unrelieved. So I can call it as brought forward loss. We might be watching that for Mr. S Mr. B afterwards. So let's try to redo the same thing for Mr. B and quite much of a help we can get from the solution of Mr. A. Uh, we just need to try and bring the changes into the figures and the title, of course. Okay. 6,000 has been the figure of the gain. Mr. B, and the loss is quite a bigger figure, 11,000. And the maximum portion of the loss that I can subtract from this side is 6,000. And the portion of the loss that we had not relieved, we have a name to it. What do we call it as brought forward capital loss? Can we quantify that figure? Easily can. The portion of the loss that we could not relieve is 5,000. And this is what we call it as current year. No, sorry, brought forward capital loss. Are you with me in this? This is called as capital loss and brought forward. Total loss was 11. So the maximum that I could have relieved was 6,000. 5,000 we could have not, which is something we will call it is brought forward and we will have no choice but to throw it into next X here. And we will go to see how will it be relieved by taking ourselves down to the next text here, which is going to be 23, 24. So at least for Mr. B, now we have seen the brought forward loss. It wasn't the case for A because A had losses, which the gains were enough to absorb the whole, even for this taxi. But for B, the losses are 11,000. The gains are not plenty to absorb. The portion of the loss that was not relieved is called as a brought forward and we have no choice but to send it to the next tax year. And here we are. Let's rub up those figures, try to bring uh, a little bit of modification since I'll have to make a room for brought forward losses even over and above to the annual exemption. Capital loss uh, brought forward. So that is the amount I can write it here. And here I can fix in the figure of capital loss. But that too is brought forward. Okay, somewhere over here we will have, yeah, it's good now. It's all planned. Both of those losses, but the one that comes in the sequence is the current year, then in the followed by the brought forward one. What is the data for this year itself? 22,000 has been the figure of the gain. 13,500 has been the figure of loss. 
13,500 has been the figure of loss. Which tax here we are into right now? This one. So for this tax here, this loss should be called as the current year capital loss. We know that something is coming from the last year and we're keeping a record of it. That figure is what? 5,000? Figure is what? 5,000. That figure is what? 5,000. So will I be able to insert that figure in? Looks to me we can because the gains are plenty that can absorb the current year loss in the brought forward. But this will create the one issue. Which is the climax. When the brought forward losses are relieved, we take them into next tax year, fine. But we will have to consider not to waste the annual exemption of that tax year by relieving the brought forward loss. So I am a little bit reluctant to write the 5,000 because I have a feeling by doing so, I will be having a chance of wasting the part of that exemption that cannot happen. This rule is only and only applicable to the broad forward losses. When you take the broad forward losses down to the next tax year, you will have to respect not wasting the exemption of that tax year. So to not to do that, the way is to write down the figure of that exemption beforehand this way. which means in order not to waste the annual exemption, the net capital gains must be the same as the figure of annual exemption. And then I can come to fix it up in the balancing figure, which will be the figure of the brought forward loss. So with the help of this question, we've been able to understand this. And that figure is just 2,500. Any amount of loss has not been relieved we will continue to carry forward because that carry forward task is infinite. But certainly, blindly, you could have not fixed in the 5,000 over here. As a result of that, you would have hurt the annual exemption of this tax here and that cannot happen with broad forward loss. Current year capital loss can do that. Broad forward loss capital cannot. This is what you have to understand and make the difference of current year brought forward that when we have a current year capital loss, we just come to subtract the whole of the amount, even if we waste the exemption. As you can see, Mr. A has a current year capital loss and we are deducting it regardless of the fact that part of the exemption we have wasted does not really matter. But when it comes to a brought forward loss, we will have to respect this. How to start working backward. Write the annual exemption beforehand so that this figure can be fixed in is like a balancing one, which is what I did. And I was not reading this point, but now I will come to finally. That is written away. The maximum amount of the brought forward loss that can be relieved in a given tax year is restricted to the amount that does not waste that tax year's annual exemption. And that is what we've been able to restrict it over here, not deducted the whole of that 5,000. Will you be able to remember that? And this is what the examiner will be looking at it. But any, anyone can do this plus minus. But this is what the examiner will be looking at it, that if you have respected that out where you have to, and lose the marks if you have not. Convinced? And now you get the reason why I was trying to explain you the annual exemption before I was going to take a question on loss because these two discussions are related. You could have not possibly done this question without having a knowledge of annual exemption. The reason why I have finished this off first before I take a question that takes the losses and exemptions both within. And this by we have been able to touch the bottom of this performa, the current year loss, the brought forward and the exemption. And we are at this point. Task is not over. We still have to continue. At least we have touched the bottom of this performa. The last thing that needs to understand is to tax the gains. 
by using the rates and we are heading towards are you convinced to the treatment of losses then comes the discussion in regards to capital gains tax liability computation capital gains tax liability computation so they say that okay if your gains they fall into that barrier the rate of tax is 10 percent if they go up to that mark the rate becomes 20 percent if they fall in this barrier the rate is 10 percent and if they go up to that mark the rate becomes 20 percent this is a normal gain but we have another denomination we have to respect they say that okay if the disposed asset is a residential property is a residential property th these are the normal rates i can label it as normal which is applicable to every scenario and this is applicable to residential property for example a house apartment villa cottage mansion 18 and 28 so the rate becomes 18 and 28 when it comes to a residential property otherwise normally 10 20 may it be a business asset means plant build factory building office building and all residential property will take 18 28 percent and i've mentioned that over here it's 10 20 18 20 for residential 10 percent if they fall into the first this much mark 20 if they go up to that mark and everywhere else i have been mentioning 18 percent for residential and 28 percent for residential alongside you will never be confused about you'll never be forgetting it if i have been able to specify it finally to understand i can make two examples case one where i can suppose the capital gains are or the taxable gains are 20,000, they definitely fall into a very first band. I chose the rate of 10% by N1. It comes to apply the CGT liability turns out to be what? Twenty thousand and ten percent two thousand. And then it comes to case number two. Then it comes to the case number two. Now I suppose if the taxable gains are 45,000. So that definitely falls into a second band, not the first one. So we just not go to pick the rate of tax and flat apply 20% to part by part. Up to this point of mark 10%, access will only take 20%. So here, if I have to work the capital gains tax liability, it will go like 37700 at 10%. Only the access will take 20%. And access is going to be what? 37700. Minus 45,000, that's going to be 37300. So 37700, the 10% of that, and 7300. That is 14600 plus. The total turns out to be 52300. If the calculations have not been an issue, this is the amount that I have done 5230. The two possibilities you can have, and I have explained the both of two that, okay, if the gains, they fall into a second band, you just don't pick the 20% and apply the flat 20% rate. Has to go limit by limit up to this market and access will only take that 20%. And I am calling it as taxable gain, which means it's my assumption that these gains are after annual exemption already. 
because the gain that you get after the exemption is called as taxable gain. So it's obvious that if I've used this word taxable, it's already after taking into account of annual exemption. We are into tax year 23-24, which we know that starts on 6th of April 2023, ends on 5th of April 2024. And if I have to pay a capital gains tax for this tax year, by what is the deadline to pay that? It says 31st of Jan, following the end of tax year, which means the tax year ends on 5th of April. And the due date to pay this by is 25. Okay with that. 31st of Jan, following the end of tax year. Thirty first of Jan, following the end of this tax year. So, if the tax year ends on fifth of April, twenty twenty four, the deadline to pay this is by thirty first of Jan, twenty twenty five, and it's all written there. You also can come to read it. For tax year, this much has to be by that day, and that is a rule of a law. That pretty much ends up the talk of this first chapter being only left up with application five, which will sum up the entire talk of a course of a today within one. We can do that by spending the next 10 minutes on to wrap up. So what has been asked in the application number five will be in, in fact, the revision of what we've been doing it from the past two and a half hours or so. They want us to calculate the capital gains tax payable for the tax year 23-24 and state the due date for payment. Mike sold an innocent property. <clears throat> Mike sold an innocent property on the 1st of October 2023 for 700000 He had acquired the building for 100000 in the month of March, which he came to extend it at a cost of 20000 in July 14. So relevant facts have been given. They have sold it up for this much, acquired the building for this much, extended it at a cost of 20,000. Mike also has disposed of this painting on 1st of Feb 2024 for 10,000. So we have two disposals in one question. You have seen one more question in the past, having two of disposals into this one even has. Auctioner fees 2% which is what we call it as incidental cost of disposal. He acquired the painting back in 2018 for 30,000. He had a capital loss brought forward. See, this question takes almost everything in. So capital loss brought forward is this time just being given. Oh, they have given this. Mike has a taxable income of 15,000 in this tax year. What is this taxable income? What is the whole role of this? Why have they provided this income to us when we are dealing with capital gains? We will see. At least let's get done with the gains computation by making the two of those columns, investment property column and the painting column. Uh, which application is that? Number five. So I guess we will have to come and repeat that performer so I can take a bit of a help from this question once being solved just to save. So we have two assets to write it very next to. We have property and we have painting. <clears throat> so Mike sold an investment property on the 1st of October 3 for 700,000. Let's go to write it as the balance of proceeds. 
he had acquired the building for 100,000. Fine. That is the acquisition cost and extended it at a cost of 20,000. That is the extended cost. Uh, they're providing us nothing except we have to go and take ourselves down to painting. So painting being disposed for how much? 10,000. And on the painting, they have incurred a cost of incidental by 2%. So the 2% of that has to be 200 only. Uh, they're providing us with the cost of 30,000. Simple to work. This will be 580. I guess I do not have to even use the calculator. It's too easy to get 700 minus the 100,600 minus 20. That's going to be 580,000. So this is 10,000. This is 200. This is 30,000. Well, in fact, we've got a loss. Now, this takes us back to the same situation as we were learning today that one column has a prof uh, gain, the other has a loss. And also, we will have to check the dates of disposal. So to which tax year that disposal belongs to, that looks to me belongs to tax year 23-24. Is it? And that looks to me the case for this one also. That's also 23-24. So both the disposals belong to the same tax year. That makes me to call this loss as current year capital loss. And I can simply come to offset this against the capital gains of the same tax year. And I can do this out by taking the row very next to this way. We're calling it as current year capital loss. It's two zero two double zero. And then we have a the capital loss brought forward. The question provides us with a broad forward loss, and we know that we have to be a little stri uh, strict onto this broad forward loss so that we should not be wasting. But I guess this time the gains are plenty. See, the figure of the gain is a six digit figure. The losses are hardly five digit. So I have a feeling this time that the losses will not create any issue, and I'll be able to subtract the whole of the amounts easily. And then I'll be able to subtract the annual exemption also, which is one, two, three, double zero. The so five eighty thousand minus two zero two double zero minus one nine triple zero six thousand. Sorry. That is the exemption of the last text. We still have it in mind. 580,000 minus 20200 minus 19,000 minus 6,000. That figure is turning up to be 534800. So when this thing started off today, yeah, when this thing started off today, we, we started off with nothing. And you see, we single-handedly are preparing the whole performer by our side. After learning it, making it show that we have learned every bit of it. Is it? Everything on the way has nicely been talked about. May it be an exemption topic, may it be the losses current year brought forward. May it be a sale to a connected party, gift involved, a treatment of incidental costs of in, uh, acquisition and disposals involved. Everything has been taken a well care of. And we are just into the last parts of this chapter now, working the liability of the tax, which we can in a continuation of that on the next page on top. So not, not to forget the band limits. One pound to three double seven double zero. The rate of tax is ten percent. Access twenty eight percent. Now the question involves the property. 
But the problem is that this property is an investment property, not a residential property. So you cannot expect to apply 28%, 18% weight over to it. Investment property is the property that you uh, hold it with the intention of letting it out to someone else to get rentals back on. That's not the property you live in by yourself in. It's not a residential house. It's not the place that you reside in. It's not a family house. So not every property will attract that 18 to 28% rate. There you also have to understand. So specifically the word residential property has been used elsewhere. A private house, a family house, a house in which you and your family live in is called as a residential property. Not any property. So we'll stick to that 10, 20% rate. And looks to me the gain falls into a second band. Surely it falls into a second band and we will have to tax this much of the gains at 10% and access at 20%. But this is where also we will have to try and understand something very, very, very important. The whole part of the question when I was solving, I was not coming to look down to this thing, but now I will. The question provides us with another very important piece of information. The question provides us with the taxable income. Fine. Why? The taxable income is the income that is subject to what type of tax? Income tax. It's income. Subject to income tax, it can be an employment income, it can be a trading income, it can be a rental income, it can be an interest income, it can be a dividend income. But at the end of the day, it is an income which is subject to income tax, which is what not we are learning it right now. That's not the topic of the moment. And then, then why we are taking this into our talk then if this is subject to income tax, not subject to capital gains tax? Still, it has a role to play while computing the liability of capital gains tax. And that role to play is that these band limits are available once to each taxpayer in each tax year. Means these band limits are available once in that tax year to me. And I have to use the same band limits to tax my incomes and capital gains from. And in priority, income will take the first portion of it and then capital gains will take the remaining. So I will have to try and highlight that, okay, 15,000 somewhere lies over here. 15,000 lies somewhere over here that this much proportion of the band limit has been exhausted by the income of individual. This much of the band limit has been exhausted by the income of individual. And we have taxed it by using the rates of income tax. We are not interested how to tax this income, but at least we are interested in knowing that what proportion of the band limit has been exhausted by the income of individual. That's 15,000. Then what is the remaining that I can use that for capital gains from this point of mark to this point of mark can simply be found. Can simply be found three double seven double zero minus fifteen thousand. That's going to be double two. So this one now can be used for capital gains. That if I will have to tax the capital gains, I will be able to tax them at the maximum of ten percent up to this mark. Since this much of the portion of the band limit has already been used or exhausted by the income of individual, cannot be used. Obviously, this limit is fully to be used at flat 20, but at 10%, it is the maximum amount that we can use that for capital gains. That's the whole implication of this one amount in the last that they provided. And good that we've understood that before this chapter is to finish. So I will have to text the gains by this much at the rate of 10%. Access at 20%. So what is the access? The total gains are 53480. 
the total gains are five three eight double zero five four three eight double zero minus two two seven double zero it's five two double one double zero at twenty percent that's gonna be one zero four two two zero this is two two seven zero there you go that is the liability we have been able to find for capital gains tax. A to Z, everything what could have been done, we have been able to. Can you, can you see anything that's not been done in it or we are leaving it unexplained? Even that part in the last, we've been able to work it out. Income tax, how to calculate? Not interested. At least we're interested in knowing that out of this, this much band limit has been exhausted on the way by the income of individuals so that we can give the remaining part to that capital gains to be taxed at 10% that we did. Access will definitely take flat 20% because after that we, we have flat 20%. If that was the residential property, only difference would have been the difference of rate of tax. That's it. Nothing would have changed except the rate of tax pretty much ends up what was planned into this chapter. And how extensively, with a lot of patience, it's been understood. This one chapter and the one course that we've conducted today, based on to that, lots of you have been able to realize it that, okay, how the courses will go to run the next four months. The level of lecturing, the level of uh, illustrations and examples to explain that little point and the number of options that I tried to create it that, okay, if this happens, this is what you have to do. If this is happened, you have to do this. And at the end of the day, the notes, they become so easy to read when you take my explanation first and you come back to visit them after. And they are not as detailed as the study text are. You people have seen that today. Every week, like I told you, if you have got some issues in the last figure is 534800 minus 22700. I see you used another figure. I'm confused. Have I? Let me go to visit that page. 534800 or 543800. Five, yeah, just a change in the figure. What do we call this thing as an accounting? We, we call it as transposition error. You swap the two figures within mistakenly. So it was actually 534800 and it was taken as 543800. It's exactly called as transposition error. So let me go to correct. According to that, slightly the computations will change. Five, three, four, eight, double zero. Okay, it's making it sure now it's right. So this figure, according to that, will change this one also and this one also. The double two seven double zero minus five three four eight double zero. It's five one two one double zero. One zero two four two zero, and the total turns out to be one zero four six nine zero. So this much, like I told you, if there are some arithmetical problems being done on the way somewhere, since lots of things go in front of me when I conduct the course practices, trying to sketch up the whole topic in mind and delivering, and then speaking, and then using the calculator. So can happen occasionally some figure has wrongly been punched somewhere in which you have a job to correct because this will benefit the others not to be confused later on by that. Pretty much ends up the talk of this chapter 17. What we have done, the basics of capital gains tax. And you can see the amount of work that we have done in just one chapter. And if you will not take this along, revise it. In that week itself, you will start piling it up. And the course of text becomes difficult to pass when you have too much of things being piled up 
and you do not have the time to study. You, because you cannot remember lots of computations, lots of performers within the less time, although technically, logically, conceptually, not as tough as some other subjects are. But because of too much of computations, performers and all become very difficult when you start taking it too lightly by not revising. Every course we conduct is a continuation of the previous one. What are you expecting to see in the next course will be a continuation of what we are doing today. Don't expect to just step into next class without being bothered to revise this. You'll do a suicide by yourself and will make the mess of this course by yourself. I will keep on warning you so that later, in case you will not make it up to, you will be blamed by yourself for, I will not. With this note, the course of today has come to an end. I will see you the next week to continue the topic of capital gains tax. Have a good day. Have a good weekend. Thank you very much.